Are there any changes, additions to those minutes anybody would like to make at this time? If not, I'll accept a motion to adopt the minutes. So moved. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, the minutes from the last meeting are adopted. Uh, this was originally scheduled to be our last meeting. It's not clear that it will be. Obviously, it depends on what happens today. But um, Paul has sent to each of us recommendations on each of the charges. Uh, I think he asked for input on that and did not receive any. Um, what I'd like to do today is start with charge number two, which is the recommendation on the funding level. Uh, we've been discussing this one for the last two or three meetings on basically getting to uh, the right language. I think the general principle we had agreed on fairly soon. This the, the basic premise here. Don, is that, yes. This is BJ. Somebody just joined the line. Could I ask that they mute their phone because there's a echo coming back? I just did. Thank, thank you, Rod. <laughs> Um, the funding recommendations are based on the premise of returning to the 2011 rates for the INO formula and uh, phasing up to that level. Uh, Paul has added some language in here to make it clear that this is a, an increase of $281 million, a 6.4 percent increase over the current biennium. Uh, we also have the language in there that was discussed earlier. Uh, that gives us a national comparison that the uh, uh, higher, educa higher Education Policy Institute had done and made a presentation to us on earlier. Are there any changes to this language uh, that anybody wishes to recommend at this time? If not, I'd like to go ahead and adopt this as our recommendations. Is there a motion to do so? So moved. This is BJ. It's been moved and seconded by Mark to adopt these re these recommendations for charge number two. Uh, all in favor, say aye. aye. Those opposed. Okay. The uh, aye. recommendations for charge number two are adopted. Then. Also on charge number three, uh, Paul has sent language that we've also been discussing the last two or three meetings. Uh, he did not receive any additional feedback from the last iteration of that. This has to do with the competency-based funding. Uh, are there any recommended changes to the language for number three? Okay. If not, I'll take a motion to adopt this recommendation as well. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to adopt the recommendations for charge number three on competency-based courses. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay, those recommendations are adopted as well. On charge number one on outcomes-based funding, the language that Paul sent out is essentially a, recommend, a recommendation for <coughs> Uh, option number two, among the options that were sent to us. Are there any recommendations or discussion on the, this language? Just, John, this is BJ. Yeah, BJ. I, I still have some concern about the complexity of this whole thing. Um, you know, we, uh, I think last year's committee worked really hard at getting something that was n not necessarily simple but easy to understand. And, and we're adding some complexities into this that, you know, I'm afraid they're going to be extremely difficult to explain to the legislature. Okay, and just to clarify, uh, option two is taking what was done last time. Um, scaling, weighting, and monetizing that that model, and um, separating out the institutions by accountability group. Is there anything else in option two that 
we need to know about? That's pretty much Nope, that's right. it. Okay. Yeah, Just the monetizing piece of it, it that is taking the iPads um, uh, factor of uh, faculty salaries, and so it's based on the way the uh, it's the amount of money that you're paying your salary then that uh, is driving the monetized uh, level of the right. The national average SREB salary by a Carnegie classification is what is being used to monetize the model. So the effect of that on is that the more that you're paying, then the more that that uh, is is adding to the weight of the, the points that uh, are, be, are being accumulated. That's correct. I have some problems with that from a point of view of an institution that is not is not putting huge. I mean, it does not have what the other institutions are in terms of putting in uh, faculty salaries. So. So in option number six, you removed the monetization piece of it, and of course you also increased the at-risk weight, but at least for that one piece, option number six right. addresses that particular issue. Uh, now the swing in losses, wins and losses here is greater uh, with the research institutions bearing the brunt of that. So um, I'm assuming option six doesn't look that good to the group as a whole. Yeah, go ahead, Barry. Uh, option two, I agree, poses some issues for me. I mean, we have spent a lot of time in the last committee and some time in this committee going over the metrics a success and we keep going back to those deciding well we need what would we do with more critical fields or what would we do with that and then so we go through all the metrics and then in a sense we multiply it times some other figure that's pulled from out here which in essence compromises it has a much much more of an impact than the metrics almost themselves it reminds me somewhat of, of a class where I've gone over with the students what it takes to get an A or a B or a C. And you've got to do this and you've got to do that. But to really finally determine your grade, we're going to, get the, we're going to go through the metrics and then we're going to multiply it times your parents' income. <clears throat> I don't think the students would think it was very fair. And I agree completely, Ed. I mean, if we're that was the beauty, and I go back to what was already said about the simplicity. I know the legislature didn't buy it the last time, but it was a, a much, much simpler model. And while we need to accomplish mission, I don't think we're accomplishing what was under that critique of mission coming out of the legislature by accentuating that those who have are assumed to have much larger salaries or expenditures should get much more out of a the icing on the cake with the ice and again we're not talking about as in Tennessee where we had a hundred percent of it that would go into the distribution. We're only talking about 10% of the undergraduate. So you've got this icing on the cake that's supposed to be for doing a good job in terms of the metrics. And then you turn right around and compromise the metrics by multiplying it times a figure that has nothing to do with the metrics. And indeed, one like your institution that is doing a, probably a, a very good job of turning out degrees per dollars expended is penalized because you're not spending enough dollars per degree in producing a degree. So I find this, the monetization of this thing, very unacceptable and almost completely contradictory to the whole concept of having a performance piece that's, guess what, based on performance.
So if we, if we remove monetization, uh, which effectively eliminates option two, or at least that particular version of option two, the remaining options we have, six, seven, eight, nine, um, all have monetization removed. So that issue has been addressed. Um, now there are other issues that arise, of course, when we do that, which is most evident in option six. Uh, option seven is one in which Paul sought to optimize the weights per accountability group, and that did have the effect of smoothing out some of the, the losses, um, but there is still a group of institutions that um, lose a fair amount under that, that proposal. Uh, options eight and nine were looking at specific, yes, yeah. And there's another feature to seven that I think is worth uh, stopping and talking about a little bit, and that is the evening the values across. Um, one of the things that uh, about the previous uh, committee's uh, recommendations was I n never could figure out whether there was any discussion about, you know, what is the way uh, the importance of total degrees versus graduation rate per critical fields. I mean, because it. It worked out. Some areas got almost no funding in the way that it worked out just uh, as a result of the formula. Um, by Paul leveling out, making it even across the board, we at least have a start, starting point of how much does are we going to value um, each one of these things to get done what we want to get done. I mean, if, if we have to look at what is the uh, object of this thing, and if, it, if the object is to increase graduation, to increase success, then by having it uh, at, at least at a level, uh, you can look at it from two ways. One is what is the value of that in terms of uh, that particular variable in terms of incentivizing um, the performance that we're looking for. And secondly, you might be able to look at that from the point of view of the mission of particular institutions, how pertinent or how relevant is that particular variable to that particular institution given the mission and given the characteristics of the students they serve. So it seems to me that the optimization says more about uh, it, that's an important thing to do because it does sort of say how it's, uh, you know, if, if everybody were to go with the, the factors that would most be fav most favorable to them, that uh, this is where it would line up. And you can see some patterns emerging from that optimization. But I think more significant is getting us to the, the point in the conversation where we're, we look at them, these as equal and then make discussions about which way do you want to go given your mission and given the incentives and, uh, that we're trying to promote. And I think that's a good point, that uh, if we go the direction of option seven and work from that, that uh, is one of the things that we'd have to address is, is how, how to weight or how to scale each of those. Um, I really think, um, you know, where we are in terms of viable options, the way I look at it is uh, either work from option one back to where we were, uh, what we started with, uh, or option seven. Is there any, does anyone wish to discuss option eight or nine before we kind of proceed that way? Well, option eight and nine are parts of option seven, correct? They are variations, yes. <clears throat> right. Option eight has the student characteristic adjusted graduates included in it. It's identical to option seven, except it has that one additional metric. And then option nine has the transfer degrees that were asked for. So I just included that as an additional metric to option number seven. This is Marty at um, Pan Am, and, and option eight and nine just seem to take that piece of seven and kind of you know equalize the, the differences a little bit more. I mean, they just... I think I think option eight does that. Uh, however, I think option eight may be the most difficult to try to explain and to um, convince the legislature that it's a a uh, an appropriate metric. Uh, it's also, uh, as I understand it, 
difficult uh, from a mathematical standpoint, I guess you would say, or a calculation standpoint? It's pretty complex. Mm -hmm. Now, on this is Rod Mabry. Yeah, Rod. I would agree that uh, that option seven probably has the best uh, set of characteristics to sell to the legislature. I guess the concern I would have with uh, seven, just looking at the numbers, is it's going to be pretty tough to explain why somebody gets a 510 percent increase. Or a 300 and whatever it was, or 257. Well, I would like to point out that those percent changes are from option number one. It's not a it's not a total funding change. It's not a fund, it's not a comparison to what they would have gotten to the INO. It's just the change between what resulted in option one and what resulted in this particular option, which was the intent to come up with something different. So those swings they may be appropriate. They may not. Yeah. Yeah. Although op option one. For most institutions, it's pretty close to the I know. So it's, for most of the institutions, it, it's uh, what's shown here is a pretty good reflection of uh, what the difference is between I know as well. Uh, I think clearly, if, you, if we were to go the direction of option seven, uh, there would be much more work we'd need to do to, to get this right. Um, so I think just to cut to the chase, um, you know, when we started the process working off of uh, what the committee recommended last interim, uh, the commissioner had indicated that he was fine with that proposed formula and was certainly interested in us looking at that, determine if there was anything we wanted, to, any changes we wanted to make, or obviously go a different direction if we so chose. In terms of selling to the legislature, uh, we have made some improvements to the option one recommendation, if that were the direction we were going to go. Um, we've separated out as a separate formula. We've included in our recommendations that this new formula be funded only after the INO uh, recommendation has been addressed. Uh, we've also added a phase in to the model, which gives institutions uh, more time to adjust uh, to any changes that would need to be made. So I think all those things improve um, the sellability to the legislature. The one thing that is not addressed in Chapter 1 uh, that was raised during the legislative session is the, the mission issue. Um, so I think one of our options is, the, the simplest, most straightforward option, is to stick with Option 1 with the additional changes that we've made uh, additional recommendations that we've made to go with it and present that as our recommendation. The other option would be to go to option seven and um, which does take into account accountability groups and at least seeks to address the mission issue that way. Um, but I think there is agreement that option seven as it exists here uh, would not be satisfactory. So uh, the, what we would need to do is uh, we look at the scaling issue that Ed has raised to see uh, if there's, uh, if it's more appropriate to scale certain metrics differently. And then the other thing would be for the accountability groups would need to meet and uh, reach agreements on what the appropriate weights are for each group. Uh, and option seven, Paul is, taking a stab at just determining what that would be, but um, the thought was, like Tennessee, that we would allow the institutions to have some input on that. So both of those things would have to happen to get option seven into a form that I think we would have support of the committee to go forward on. Uh, uh, this, this is Dana. Um, uh, looking at this, I guess my question on going away from option one I realize it's because the last time, and we've done a lot of work with the different metrics this time, is that we've not captured mission as much in this as they might like, um, or accountability group. However, um, when you look at that, we're only putting the undergraduate portion of the formula and looking at this for undergraduates. 
So that also doesn't capture mission because some of the institutions have a mission much more toward graduate education. So if, if you really are trying to capture mission, then you would have to make, and it, then we'd have to go back to a different type of assumption. And, and partially it's how we, I think, how we lay this out and explain this potentially to the legislature in that we've done the work with success, success metrics for undergraduate education as that part of the mission because that's, that's one aspect of it. I think that's a good point, Dana. Um, there are, obviously we have metrics within option one that uh, reflect mission differentiation. It's just not all that clear uh, to a legislator looking at this. Uh, but how it's presented obviously makes a big difference. Um, but I mean, what's what's the thought of the committee on this? I mean, it, it is correct to say that by only using undergraduate degrees here, that um, that does make the accountability grouping a little bit um, awkward, I guess. But could I Harry? try to? Could I ask a question in terms of trying to figure out what, what do we really mean by mission? Do we mean something more than some institutions are able to have a certain type of student who comes in and others are not in such a situation? Or what would, what would be the other things in terms of differentiation of mission that would that should be taken into consideration when you're talking about the metrics that we have in front of us, which deal overwhelmingly with undergraduates. What, what, what's the other part of the mission other than the quality of the student who's yeah, coming and in? I, and I guess each of us had our, had our own opportunities to experience legislative discomfort uh, with this. I found more than anything else didn't have, didn't have so much to do with your commitment to graduate education or undergraduate, it had to do with the nature of the students coming to your institution. Right. Uh, and it, it, it leans in the direction that we haven't been able to lean, and I, because it's a very difficult direction to lean in, which is, can you really determine the value added that an institution has provided based on the type of students that they are getting and at what cost. And uh, the things that we have used here, because they, they are the things that are available to us, uh, really don't address that. Um, I still think the, the, the largest factor is going to always be any time we demonstrate, regardless of whether we're saying, yes, but this is add-on money here. Um, anytime we demonstrate these huge swings in funding, we're going to immediately get certain legislators' attention. And I think the other part of it when it comes to mission, it, it had more to do, at least in my opinion, it had more to do with the nature of the students coming into the institution. Well, I would agree with you. And therefore, I'm, I guess I wonder why we have to make it so complex. I mean, there's one column in this, and I don't know what the outcome would be. If you used option one with as close as we can get to the quality of the student, which is option eight adjusted for SAT and GPA. Right? I mean, that's, that gets as close as we're going to be able to determine how the quality, of, and with Pell Grants, how the quality of the student differs at each institution. Plus, what you're also saying in, a, in addition to that was we can't have great variations in the distribution, even if it's icing on the cake, because it may become part of the cake and not icing on the cake. And that's our suspicion, our concern, and our fear. So um, I think we have to do two things, is come up with a formula and a model that takes account of the differences in the student, but at the same time doesn't really have much of an impact. In other words, we have some ways of moderating the total amount of money that can be potentially lost if it's part of the formula. I think one of the things we've, we've repeatedly tried to do, and obviously we haven't gotten there yet, but is 
to get the big toe in the water, to at least say here is a step in this direction that isn't disastrous for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I agree. And um, that will be refined over time. And, uh, and you know, I agree with, with John and really what everybody has said about what we produced last year. I, you know, I think we got as close as we could get with, with the metrics we were working with. But the two, the two big issues came back to the distributions and the way those distributions appeared. And it came back because I, I heard numerous legislators talking about this doesn't capture the nature of this institution. If you're talking about the University of Texas in Austin and you're talking about Texas A&M Kingsville, you're talking about two different groups of students with different challenges and opportunities. And I agree completely with that. <clears throat> That's not a solution, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Well, I would recommend we take option one and try to compromise it in some way by the quality of the students. And it's, it, there, there's not a, you suggested this the last time, and we've got a column that tries to do it. And then if, there, if that results in too big a, a modifications of the allocations, then have, just have stop losses as an arbitrary. You can't lose any more than this, and you can't gain any more than this. But I do think we're going to have to keep it as simple as possible. Because if, if you're suspicious in the first place and then the explanation is more complex, uh, you're not going to get less suspicious. <clears throat> Are there any more, any other thoughts on this? Well, this is Danny, and I go back to the whole idea of the mission. I mean, with it being undergraduate, you know, and they, I know there, there's been discussions about the Tennessee model. Um, and they did take mission into account, but the Tennessee model wasn't targeted at just one segment of the um, population. So I think that's part of the explanation if we get that question as we're looking at this with legislators. I think it's fair to say that when, the way we ended last time, um, I think everybody knew that this issue of the quality of the student was um, not satisfactorily addressed, but I think it was a conscious decision at that time that that would be an issue that would be, it would be an ongoing issue that the committee would deal with uh, or the legislature could choose to deal with on their own um, as we implement the model. And certainly taking a phased in approach makes that easier to do. It gives us more time to work through all these issues. Uh, some like uh, what is done in, in model in option eight is is complicated, and we would have to do something different to get to that issue. But that's not to say that we can't do it if there's not a way to do it. Um, I think also after looking at option seven, the issue that Ed raised, it something that we did not talk about last time was the scaling issue for each of the metrics. And if we were to go back with option one and really pay more attention to those scaling issues, uh, we might actually come to something much more satisfactory than where we ended up, because we can address some of these issues that way as well. Um, so, I mean, I'm perfectly comfortable with what Perry is recommending, that we go back to option one, we work on um, improvements to that model that we believe address its shortcomings, which is primarily the quality of the student. Uh, to the extent that we can do that within the metrics we already have, I think that's good, uh, even that's better. Uh, if we really feel like we have to add a new metric, then uh, assuming we can get to something that's not too complicated and does in fact uh, make a significant contribution to it, then that's certainly something we ought to be looking at. And I think that's something that we could do um, without a whole lot of more meetings involved, um, because we're really narrowing it down to just one or two issues. And I think through various uh, options that we can develop on this, we can probably get some consensus built around that just through email exchanges and so forth. And uh, we'll have to have an, at least one more meeting just to get to a final adoption, obviously. But 
Um, I mean, does anybody have a different idea of how we might approach it? So just so that we get some clarification for staff, um, you want to address the issue of the type of students being admitted and Ed's issue of the scaling? Make some determination of how important metrics are as far as the scaling? Or use that maybe as a way of um, looking at the different missions? I think, and I, anybody wishes to express a different view of it, please jump in. I, um, I think we need to try to get the scaling done right first. Uh, so I think we need to play with that a little bit, get comfortable with where we think we ought to be on the scaling part of it, of the, of the, the existing model, and then look at introducing these other factors. Okay. That may require us to revisit some of the scaling once we do that, depending on how much of an impact they have. But um, but I, but I think looking at scaling first it makes sense. I just saw him because I brought up the scaling. But I will tell you that as I've thought about the discussion on the scaling, scaling means different things to different people according to their mission. So it's one thing to look at graduation rate when you, you know, you have, you're a selective institution. And then it's another when you're an open admissions institution. So it is, I mean, it, I don't want the scaling discussion to, I, I believe the scaling discussion, which I believe the committee needs to have, but I want to make clear that I, I, I will bring up the fact that the, it will get us into the differentiation in the type of students that are coming in. So. I mean that. <clears throat> are you talking about when you talk about scaling? Where where is weight? Where are weights and all of that? Well, it's uh, weights was another way of thinking about. So, scaling. so you're really using yeah. the two right. terms synonymously. Right. Hey, John. Yes. It's BJ. Can I make a couple of comments? Sure. Um. First of all, I want to double check something, and I, I never noticed this before. Have we um, have we abandoned critical fields being double weighted? Because in the write up, it's not necessarily shown as a double weight. The write up, like John said, matches option two, um, and the only place on this uh, set of models that it's double weighted is option number one. Okay, that's my first question. My second just comment is, and this is kind of going back to what Dana had mentioned about the mission and trying to include the grad, you know, the you know more than just the undergraduate. I, it seems that I remember, and maybe I'm, maybe I don't remember correctly, but when we were asked to develop the outcomes-based model last last time, we were told to exclusively focus on undergraduate. And so I think if you try to add a mission piece in there and you add graduate, some sort of graduate into the mission that you're kind of, I mean, you're trying to mix apples and oranges. Because if you want to add your graduate mission in here to get some um, of the mission issue in, it seems that you would then want to come in and add your graduate metrics. And that's just kind of my view of it. And the other the other two things I'm going to say is just that, you know, in previous uh, formula advisory committees, when we talked about mission, we always, we always kind of punted on that one because of the weighting on the semester credit hours, because the weighting gave some form to a complexity, which in a lot of people's minds equaled to mission, you know, the complexity of the, of the campus. And then the, the last thing I was going to say is we have a metric for at-risk student. So in my opinion, that somehow gets to the nature or the quality of the student as well. So those are just maybe food for thought, if nothing else. Yeah, BJ, I think uh, when we finished last time, the at-risk uh, metric was the metric that I think we thought had the potential to address this issue of uh, student quality, and that that would be the, the one in particular that we need to pay attention to going forward. 
uh, in terms of making any adjustments. Now, one thing that has come up uh, with this this round is, uh, and I can't remember if it was Lee or who it was that pointed out that the at-risk metric that we have here is a very broad definition. And so we have a lot of students in the system that are being counted as at risk. Mm -hmm. um, that may be fine, that may be where we need to be, but uh, I think to get to that, the issue that Perry's raised, one of the things we would need to do is to, to re look at the definition and determine whether or not it needs to be that broad, whether it, it may be more satisfactory to narrow that definition to, to get to it. We have information that we can show that how many students are in that at-risk category based on the metric that puts them in there. Um, the vast majority of them are based on Pell Grants, so, but we can provide that information easily. And BJ, on your point about the graduate hours, uh, uh, my sense is that there's agreement among, consensus among the committee to uh, stick with just the undergraduate hours and try to make this work. And the last time we focused on undergraduate hours because it, HB 9 had said not 10, up to 10 percent of the undergraduate funding right, yeah. and the feeling was that at, if you were only looking at undergraduate funding that it only made sense to look at undergraduate metrics. So that's why the focus on undergraduates. This time I'm not sure it's as important just given the fact that if it's going to be over and above that funding is the recommendation. But I mean undergraduates are the basis for everything else that's going on. So. And, and, and BJ, I, this is Dana, I agree. I mean when I was bringing that up, that's where I was saying that I don't think that if we add another factor for mission, um, which we're talking about, that doesn't make sense to me if we're looking at undergraduate. I'm not saying that we should add the graduate. Add the graduate. I'm just saying that it doesn't make sense to start looking at driving something by mission when we're only looking at undergraduate. Uh, just back on the, the scaling issue, just because I think maybe I'm confused on this as well. Uh, what you did last time. Some of the scaling was really based upon the general um, premise that we adopted to minimize redistributions compared to the INO formula. Right. Is that right? Yeah. So if if we looked at that issue, it would be. Uh, I mean, to me, the only reason you you would want to look at it would be: Are there metrics that we consider to be more important than the others? and make adjustments accordingly. But knowing that the more we do, the greater the redistributions are likely to get. Right. So I've looked at that, and that's exactly what happens. I think you get some larger swings than you'd hope for if, if, you, if you mess with them a little bit too much. Um, so did you try seven without optimizing? Without optimizing, Just leveling the playing field. Um, not without optimizing the weights. I have, and I emailed it to the group, and I gave you printouts for option ten, which modified the scaling. Um, it still has the opt optimized weights, so that um, each institution is applying the largest percentage to the highest point generating by accountability group, by the highest metric that generates the most points. And I adjusted the scales so that the swing seemed a little bit more reasonable. It also uh, adjusted those basically so that it made a little bit more sense. I increased the uh, total undergraduate degree scaling. I, th I think um, when we even it up, it comes out to be a weight or a scale of two. I think I raised it to ten. So I made those kind of adjustments. And you can see in column, in the column for option ten on on your chair there what what happens to uh, option seven when you do that so just to follow up on John your question then then there was the scaling issue was dealt with in the, by the previous committee 
in the sense of as they work through towards the redistribution, there was some going back discussion back and forth about what's reasonable. To That's right, right. But it, again, it was being driven at least partially by looking at ways to minimize the redistributions. It wasn't necessarily a conversation of what the right scale is. It just was more engineering it so that we started out at the same point where we were with the I no model. Paul, as I, as I look at the Tennessee model, they seem to have very clearly, and I realize they're dealing with a much smaller group of institutions than we are, but they seem to very clearly break out research, general academics, community colleges. The way we're using these formulas and the way we're using the weightings, um, and I may be misreading it, and that's why I'm going to get you to respond to it. It seems like we're still trying to apply this across the board. If there were X amount of dollars for the, for the Tier 1 research institutions, and they all competed for it, if that's the right word or the wrong word, using exactly the same metrics, and there was a, there was a pot of money for whatever we say the next category tier is and whatever the tier after that is, and each of those tiers competed for it in this, using the same metrics. This one may be different than the tier one. It seems, it seems that we keep sort of, the way we seem to be trying to apply it, they seem to keep oozing over and having an impact on everybody else in the column. And I don't know whether it's even possible to do what I'm talking about. Well, Tennessee didn't discreetly deal with those those different categories. They chose the Carnegie classification to place each institution into a particular category, and they used one pot of money to allocate across that after they monetized it down at the bottom. Option three that we presented last time that we rejected was the use of those Carnegie classifications, and I think the committee overall agreed that that wasn't a direction to go in for for Texas. It didn't um, it didn't do well with the redistribution issue. So we were treating, if you look at option three from last time, that would give you exactly what Tennessee did, but using the Texas metrics. One, the one major distinction, though, is, is that that second tier of institutions were given some flexibility in how they chose to, to be weighted based on their own individual mission. Right, and that piece, the model that I showed, we didn't, we didn't allow that. What I did do was try and match up the weighting that Tennessee used for our metrics, because many of them are identical, um, in, in the model that presented to you. So it wasn't exactly the same, but it was as close as I could get it. Uh, you know, I just keep thinking that, that we may be closer than we think we are, but we haven't quite found that way through this. <laughs> the only thing I could see that would get to what you're talking about is if the committee recommended that the legislature set an amount of funds for each group of institutions, and I'm not sure they would like that one. I agree. Yeah, that, and, and I think that was discussed some last time is uh, you, you introduce appropriations issues that <laughs> are complicated. Um, there are way. I mean, there's ways to simplify that, but it still depends upon the uh, legislature buying into the whole concept. And I think, particularly if you're, when we want to move it outside the formula as a separate formula, um, it gets, uh, it, it makes it a more difficult uh, decision for them. And we would not have any guarantees of what they might choose to do. They might choose to put all the money into the master's levels institutions or something. I think Mark would be okay with that. <laughs> well, let me uh, again try to try to uh, get to um, some final endpoint here. Um, 
do we have a consensus that we will move forward from here um, using option one and looking for ways to improve upon option one? Is everybody agreeable with that? Um, in terms of next steps, then, uh, uh, Paul has done polling on when the next meeting could be. The best date, date is not until January 24th <clears throat> to maximize attendance. Uh, of course, that date gives us a lot of time to try to work these things out, um, which is good because we, we may need it. Uh, it, it, it. Here's what we need to do then is um, I think it would be helpful for those that were not involved in the process last time to perhaps develop an option that I, I, I'll work with you on, but essentially make some adjustments to the scaling just to show what the impact is once you move away from a deliberate attempt to uh, minimize redistributions. And then, and, and then uh, we can send that out and circulate it, and to the extent that you might want to play with that, you can uh, talk to Paul about that. And then to get to the issue of the quality of the student, um, we'll need to look at the at-risk issue, and again, uh, the staff can provide us with some options on that to look at uh, and the impact that would have on the model. On the use of option eight metrics for SAT, my, my recollection is that after you did this model that Trey uh, got back with you and said this isn't exactly what he was talking about. Right. He, um, he made the modifications, a couple of modifications to the model. One of them that we haven't talked about is option eight has no scaling. Everything's at one. Mm -hmm. So uh, they all contribute at a, a scale of one, whatever points they generate, including the uh, student adjusted, student characters adjusted graduates. Um, but he, essentially what we're doing is we're, we're taking the number of graduates that you um, should have generated with the type of student that you received. So it's an effective number of graduates and not an actual. Um, I also I, I thought there was some issue with using SAT scores out there. We don't have SAT score. If you have a students who are transferring from a community college, very often we do not have SAT or ACT scores for those students. So you've got a whole group of students that you, you don't really have data for at all. In this particular model, what we did was for students that, that transferred in, we used their transferring in GPA and uh, Pell No Pell to uh, generate effective graduates. So they are represented in the model, but they're not represented by SAT score. It is clearly, it's clearly different. I would, <clears throat> I would simply say from experience that I, I would, it would be more. It would be cleaner and less complicated to go back and look at your at risk as a way of defining. I um, would agree with that. You know, I, 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 having been through this, mm -hmm. that one worries me the other way. But I think you can get at it with uh, the at risk. With the, that discussion that we're moving towards. On I agree. Road. I think that's probably the better way to go. <clears throat> okay, and that that certainly simplifies things. It makes, it makes my staff very happy. So we'll need to work with you on on how the various options we can mm -hmm. explore to do that. Um, the only other issue that I, I discussed this earlier with Paul because it, uh, on option number nine, dealing with the transfer students, I think um, when we went through this last time, uh, I think there was an issue with. <laughs> the data collection for transfer students. And we really didn't 
pursue this, this kind of direct metric, what we did adopt is the per 100 FTSC as a proxy, I guess, for that issue. Um, so one option, we, I, I think explaining this to legislators, that is the one metric that is really difficult to understand how that works. So one thing we may want to look at as a part of this exercise is removing that metric and using the transfer metric instead and just looking at that and see what the impact is. And uh, Paul has not run anything on that yet, so we don't really know what the impact will be. Right. But, uh, but if we could make that substitution and it achieves the same purpose, then uh, it's certainly easier to, to explain it to everybody what, it, what its purpose is. The, the caveat to that, uh, John, is that uh, for students, for many of us, we've got to be able to capture those transfer students because of the, the huge impact that it has on who we are uh, and the nature of our institutions. And, you know, I, it's easy for me to say that from an institution where all of my students are transfers, but even at Dominic's and, and several other people sitting around this table and not around this table, they have huge numbers of transfer students which has become more the norm than the exception. There was a time when that was the exception. It's not anymore. And, and that's why the graduates for FTE, for 100 FTE, has gained some ascendancy at the national level. It's yeah. because it cuts across all lines. And now if we can find some other way of capturing that, that's fine, but it's, we've got to be able to capture that group of students. Yeah, I, I think everybody agrees that the what the intent is there and, and that that's what we hope to achieve. I'm not really that hopeful that this other metric will work that cleanly, but I think it's something we can look at. It's definitely a cleaner metric. I mean, it's you're, you're giving an additional, essentially you're giving an additional point for every transfer graduate is what it does, which if we're collecting them all and they are identifying them all, we, we, we would be better off explaining that. It deserves examination for sure in terms of using it as a possible option. Sometimes things occur that you don't anticipate. One of them, for example, is if, if you've got 500 transfers and 480 of those transfers graduate. Another one has 800 transfers but 200 graduate. The first one is going to get a lot more, obviously, than the second. And that's because the nature of the transfer is much better, just like the nature of the student. We're getting back to that essential point again. And uh, that perhaps is corrected somewhat more by the more complicated statistic <laughs> uh, on this. But it's worth looking at for sure. <clears throat> Are there any other comments on how, we, how you might want us to proceed with, with uh, option one? If um, you'll send a notice that the next meeting will be January 24th, I assume. Yes. And uh, I know because of the holidays, that's obviously uh, difficult to get things done during that time. But before the Christmas holiday, um, Paul will have something out for people to start looking at. The one thing I will say is that. Um, when he's asked for feedback in the past, that's been kind of spotty. Uh, we really do want to bring this to a conclusion, and I think we're actually closer than we're closer than we were when I started this meeting. <laughs> uh, but uh, I really encourage you to, when you get something from Paul on this, to please provide feedback as soon as you can. Uh, and I think if so, I think we can get to a, a final recommendation on it. If it does take additional, uh, some more detailed work that we're not anticipating right now, um, then I will, uh, as chair, I'll uh, appoint a subcommittee to look at anything that requires some more detailed work or discussion among people. Otherwise, I think we can uh, resolve this through emails and obviously phone conversations and that sort of thing. So if that's satisfactory, that's how we will proceed then. 
Could, could I ask one yes. clarification, mm -hmm. not having uh, been on the committee the last time? So what we're saying by moving back to option one, we're not discarding mission, but we're going to look at weights or scaling as a way of getting at mission, because I don't want to lose that in, in all of this. I think that's central to, and, and I see mission perhaps a little differently than we've discussed it, but I think it does impact an institution's uh, performance and um, should be recognized in a outcomes-based funding model. So if, if I've heard that correct, I'm just asking for clarification. That's okay. Right. Yes, and I think I think what uh, you'll get back from Paul is something addressing that issue for people to look at, and then separate from that, uh, looking at the at-risk issue and options re related to that. Yeah, no reason. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, one concern I have is. Um, the buy-in from the higher ed uh, community in general, because, I mean, obviously the coordinating board felt blindsided by that because uh, the committee did its deliberation and, you know, it's perhaps as a pragmatic matter that it was only way, because, uh, I mean, we sort of have two masters here. We have the fact that the legislature doesn't want to see wild redistributions. You know, on the other hand, the legislature legislators responding to their particular constituents want to have the sense that the committee or the coordinating board took into consideration the specifics of, a, of their universities and their districts. And so they, they articulated that in the, by using this word mission. You know, that, well, no, no consideration was given to the mission of the institution. Everybody could compare it against each other. Um, so. You know, I'm concerned that at the end, you know, as a pragmatic matter, you know, I don't see us passing something in the legislature that isn't, you know, I think the, what you put in your recommendation right now is that in the first year, no one would lose more than 0.5 percent, and by the third year, no one would lose more than 0.1 percent, uh, 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 1 percent. Right. So, I mean, that... Actually, Tennessee told us that, too. I mean, Tennessee said as a matter of passing legislation, you had to be close to an even uh, starting point, uh, even allowing that it could diverge as time went on. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about the, just the way that this is translated back to beyond the committee, you know, to the greater kind of higher aid community. You know, uh, the rationale, and it's maybe as something that we do when we go through this conversation, we'll be able to articulate to them uh, how we've taken in consider, uh, in, into consideration their uh, critique of the previous model, um, and that we have given some weight, consideration to their particular institutions or their cluster of institutions. Um, I just think that that's something that in solving this puzzle, I mean, that we have to be able to do. And I guess, uh, and, and I understand the time limitation, so I'm, you know, I thought that at one point we would break down and there would be discussion of subgroups, you know, that would allow some feedback by uh, the accountability group back and forth. But maybe there just isn't time in the, in the you know, in the, in the, in what we're dealing with at this time. I mean, maybe you need to answer that. I mean, I mean, do you think the time frame and the way this, the, the schedule that this thing has to be in and there's just not ready for a give and take back and forth? Or? I think that the committee can um, make recommendation that it continue to be studied. This is our preliminary recommendation. Now, that would require all of y'all to continue working. So, you know, that's kind of up to you. But, you know, we can make a recommendation. It can go to our board in April. The final doesn't have to go until June to the legislature and the LBB. But I think if everybody um, was in agreement that we felt like there was some place that we were very close to getting 
better buy-in and everybody's agreement on that we could continue working on that. And um, we did that kind of with the community colleges last time, where we had a basic recommendation. And then as we got closer, we did make, there were a few little tweaks that went forward at the same time. So I think we would be willing to do that and have the board reconsider their recommendation. I mean, I, I think we can squeeze as much in as the committee wants to squeeze in and is willing to squeeze in. I think the ultimate question is how, to what extent is everyone going back and communicating with their own institutions and systems? Because we know that from recent experience that once the board adopted this committee's recommendation that there was a breakdown between that point and the first hearing in terms of whether institutions were supporting that recommendation or not. And we would like to come up with a recommendation everyone agrees with and so we'll have and, and we'll support going forward. So it's not just the legislature supporting it, but its institutions need to support it as well. And so I think beyond whatever breakdowns, if you have subgroups, if we meet with uh, our, our accountability system groups, uh, there still has to be that support at the institutions and systems themselves going forward and a, and a full understanding of what you're talking about. Because I think it's not just whether the legislature understands this or not. I think f I heard frequent, uh, I don't know if it was misunderstandings, but things were being described that were not quite, I think, what uh, the previous committee had recommended. And that's just a reality. So uh, you've put in a lot of work so far, and, and we'd like to make the most of it. And uh, you know, I, and actually, I think you know, you're, you're right. I think you're very close to a solution. It's just that that nuance that you're trying to get at, and this, this the distinction. And uh, I would say, in terms of the mission, I I, I don't know that I heard quite the discussion that you were asking about, Paula. I heard more of a discussion of who are the students as the mission versus those other distinctions. So I, I understand why you asked that question. Um, but over the years, I can say mostly what I've heard from people is they always end up talking about the students. Aside from that other mission, it's almost always about that. And I was trying to stay quiet today, but there are even other things. This is, you know, Mark, you brought up the community college transfers. Let's not forget 35% of all the baccalaureate graduates have at least 30 hours from a community college. The issue is not finding out who the transfers are, but who deciding who counts as a transfer, because they take on you know, 150 different permutations minimum. Uh, but, and how do you do that in a way that's simple to explain, as John keeps emphasizing, which he knows better than most of us, some of these things are difficult to explain, and, and even on your own campuses. So this is, we really want your guidance in terms of deciding how to do this, I think, is a final answer. I, th I think on this issue uh, that you're raising, um, there's a number of things that can be done differently, I think, to address legislative concerns. Some we've already talked about. Um, I think you can't dismiss the fact that timing alone was a big problem. Uh, we were coming off of a biennium in which we had serious cuts, and introducing a new formula at that point in time really wasn't very good timing. Um, a number of legislators really didn't want to listen to that. They were just trying to figure out how to resolve the funding problems with the current formula. Uh, Having said that, going into this next session, it would appear we'd be in a much better position to sell something like this. Uh, at least they'll be more receptive, I would think. Uh, I think there's also a matter of presentation that can be better. Uh, some of the issues that Dana raised, for instance, I think are good. Uh, uh, part of the explanation as to why this doesn't have as much mission differentiation in it as perhaps some people would like. Um, and there are, within some of the metrics that we have, there is some mission differentiation reflected there. So uh, presentation obviously is going to be very important with where we end up. Uh, and then, of course, we left last time knowing that the at-risk metric in particular was uh, an area of concern and one that needed to be looked at. So. 
we're kind of at that stage now based on our discussions today, and, and I think that's a good thing. So I think we can get there. Uh, when we get into this scaling issue, it, it may actually uh, lend itself to having some of the group discussions you're talking about. Uh, that will take more time, uh, but that might be the best way to resolve some of that if, if it's necessary. I'm hoping that we can actually sort of jump that stage by just getting the consensus of, uh, by looking at some of the, the options that we can develop and, and getting a consensus around one of those. But nevertheless, it, that may be a, a good way to do it. And if, that, if what you're thinking is that that's a way to get better buy-in among institutions, it's a step we need to take just to do it for that reason. So, you know, we're open to how we proceed here. I think we, we've got a model to work with. We've got, we've narrowed it down to a few metrics to work with. Um, that's, that's the main thing right now. And there's still time to take different approaches to how we get there. So as you get these things from Paul, um, like I say, Please provide feedback if you think it's necessary to have some uh, discussion prior to January 24th involving either accountability groups or other groups of members. Uh, please, you know, include that with your recommendations and we can try to make that all work. Uh, any other comments today, kind of where we're headed or recommendations on how we might proceed? Okay, if not, then we'll plan on reconvening for sure on January 24th, and we'll have a lot of back and forth between now and then. Thank you. Thanks, John.